Hello, 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 all you beautiful people. So right here, we have the pentavariant of pestilence. These are the usual suspects when it comes to disease, the chronic inflammation, oxidative stress combination that never goes away and over time degenerates health, burns down systems, causes progressive failure, all these things. So these are gut inflammation, obesity and insulin resistance, chronic stress, circadian disruption, and inactivity. We'll be going over each of these individually. And starting today is gut inflammation, all the factors involved in gut inflammation. Train your focus. Here we have George Foreman knocking out Michael Moore for the heavyweight champion of the world, ship of the world. If you have not seen this fight, go watch it. It is one of the classics and the theme brilliant show of strategy and focus a strategy and focus can overcome strength athleticism and everything it's just genius the gut so a recent study published in the british medical journal described the results placed a six-year-old boy on a gluten-free diet after he's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes that is the sort of diabetes where your body kills its own pancreas your immune cells will actually destroy your own pancreas and once your pancreas which produces insulin has been destroyed you can't you're stuck for life you need insulin injections because your pancreas is gone type 1 diabetes stinks very bad don't want to have that so basically do 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 yes well Within weeks of starting the diet, you no longer need insulin injections. 20 months after starting the gluten-free diet, he did not um, need daily insulin treatments. I don't know what the difference is between those, but that's good. Essentially, the gluten-free diet put his type 1 diabetes into remission. And traditionally, people think this is an incurable disease, and this was cured with a gluten-free diet. People have also cured and treated... Um, type 2 diabetes with a carnivore diet that was actually the default dietary intervention for diabetes before the invention of insulin but after we invented insulin we just figured hey have people keep eating all the crap they're still eating and just give them insulin injections because why not not that insulin injections are bad if you need them if you have no pancreas like you probably need insulin injections maybe I mean, there might be cases where people have overcome even that, but that is beyond the scope of this slide. So it's going to go over a little more about the gut. So the intestinal tract is where we absorb nutrients. It's the first barrier through which we encounter our food and water, which are parts of our environment that could contain toxins. It is the first defense against bacteria and toxins found in our diets. Most of our immune system is located in the gut, in the intestine. And the intestine and the brain are very, very closely connected. Inflammation in the gut is directly communicated to the brain, causing a body-wide stress response. And stress in the brain is communicated to the gut, which causes inflammation in the gut, again, facilitating a stress response. This is why diarrhea can be caused by stress. So you have the intestinal barrier right here. And this is a diagram I took right out of Strong Medicine. It's an excellent diagram. So... We have the microvilli here and this whole, so this is the endothelial cell, the epithelial cell. And these epithelial cells actually are like in waves as well. So you have these micro waves on top of them, but then there are larger waves forming larger versions of a pocket. It's essentially a fractal. For those of you who know what a fractal is, all of you should know what a fractal is, but it's a fractal. It's a fractal structure. So... This is at the cellular level, what it looks like. Here we have these tight junctions and bacteria, pathogens try to get through the tight junctions. When there's things are functioning properly, they can't. But things like, let's say, these are food particles, for instance. You have fats, short chain fats getting through the endothelial cells. So these are actually, in this diagram, these are actually um, amino acids, simple sugars, and the beneficial fats getting through. So these are short chain fatty acids produced by the beneficial bacteria. And this is fatty acids from our diet. These are getting through. 
And here we have gluten or an undigested protein fragment. It's not getting through. Let's say this were gluten. Um, well, I'll come back to the diagram later. So intestinal tract is designed to absorb the small, like maximum absorption within the smallest possible space. So there's lots of folds in the intestinal tract and in other videos we'll get into how the intestinal tract folds in on itself and how this is to do with meal timing and all these different things. A lot of fascinating things about the gut. But right now we're just going to focus on the intestinal barrier. The, in the endothelial cells that comprise the intestinal barrier, the lumen is the space inside the gut that is held in by the intestinal barrier. And as we can see, immune cells hang out just outside the, endothelial, the epithelial barrier, the epithelial cells forming the intestinal barrier, and they react to anything that gets through that. So anything that gets through there, it's not stopped by the immune cells. It gets into the bloodstream, it gets into the lymphatic system, but the immune cells will then react to it. And then, I mean, that's good. We don't want pathogenic things getting in, but they're constantly doing that. That'll cause inflammation, a lot of negative things. So... The failure of tight junctions to keep things in is called leaky gut or gut permeability. Leaky gut is when these tight junctions no longer work. And this triggers an immune response because whatever gets through those ends up hitting the immune system and then reacts. 70 to 80% of our immune system is in the gut. So a lot of autoimmunity and just our immune system in general, which controls our inflammation response is influenced very, very heavily primarily by the gut, like more than anything else by the gut. And that's why the gut is the primary place where autoimmunity is triggered. So autoimmunity and intestinal permeability. Autoimmunity occurs when our immune system fails to recognize its own tissue as self. Celiac is a specific type of autoimmunity where the immune system starts to destroy the cells lining the intestine. We actually attack our own epithelial cells. And once we attack our own epithelial cells, that creates nutrient malabsorption and tons of other issues because we need those epithelial cells for the absorption of these beneficial things. As we can see, the amino acids, sugars, and beneficial fats are absorbed through the epithelial cells. So when celiac destroys these epithelial cells, that messes up with that, messes up nutrient absorption, vitamin absorption, all these different things. Um, here we have a few different types of autoimmune diseases listed. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the destruction of the thyroid by the immune system. The destruction of nerve myelin, which if for any of you have an understanding of nerve neuron anatomy, that's the fatty acid sheath that covers the nerve that allows cell nerve signaling to take place. That's attacked in multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis destroys the joints of our body. And some theories of autoimmunity, I say theories because we're not very certain scientifically of what causes autoimmunity. It's a very odd phenomenon where a body is attacking itself. It's attacking its own cells as if they were foreign. But theories as to what causes autoimmunity are loss of Treg cells. Because uh, we know that Treg cells are needed to keep the balance in our immune system to keep it. It calms it down, whereas the adaptive assassins, the T cells amp it up and get it going and having a balance between these types of cells prevents the immune system from getting just too amped. It's like, um, let's go back to the hippie war protester analogy. So if the Treg cells are hippie or anti-war protesters and the um, T cells are assassins, warrior cells are meant to kill everything. If you have a society that goes too far in the direction of war, too far in that direction, then you can end up killing people who just disagree with you. And that would be an unhealthy society. So a society that gets, it gets, it's just too on edge. And then maybe even just like the slightest variation in a cell, it just starts attacking that. Or it just starts attacking it just for no reason, ultimately. But ultimately, autoimmunity is this phenomenon where the immune system is going crazy and attacking everything, including its own cells. So loss of Treg cells is implicated as a major, major cause of that. And Treg cells, as we're going to find out later, are stimulated. The growth of Treg cells is stimulated by beneficial bacteria in the gut. So ultimately, our gut health influences 
how sensitive our immune system is, how likely it is to attack, how likely it is to flare up and cause inflammation. Because even if it's not directly attacking itself, it's still causing inflammation, which is going to have a negative response. Celiac disease is triggered by intestinal permeability, as is are pretty much most forms of autoimmunity. But with celiac, it makes sense. Gluten gets through the tight junctions. And by getting through the tight junctions, it then hits the immune system. The immune system built a response to it, and then all hell breaks loose. Intestinal permeability brings bacteria, food particles, viruses, toxins in direct contact with the gut immune system, creating a reaction. And we don't take kind of the foreign matter in our blood. So unbroken down food that ends up in our bloodstream will create an immune response. And our bodies will then start thinking that that food is bad. So oftentimes um, things like binge eating uh, can trigger autoimmunity because you just, you wreck your gut by just eating too much bad food or even just too much food all at once. It just like in some extreme cases of binge eating, people eat 10, 12, 14 pounds of food at once. And it's just that will overwhelm the gut and that can cause leaky gut in and of itself. And then those food particles leak into the bloodstream and start causing reactions. So, and I've seen that before, actually. I've seen people who have developed autoimmune symptoms from binge eating. Interesting. It's an interesting thing. I don't know how common that is, but I've seen it before. And there could have been some latent intestinal permeability going on there, but really any time that undigested food particles or things that shouldn't be getting through the gut are getting through the gut into the bloodstream, this is going to cause an immune response and cause the body to react to these things and react in general, cause inflammation, cause oxidative stress. So the triggers of intestinal permeability Gluten and other dietary triggers stress the gut-brain axis and dysbiosis. Short-term gut permeability is a normal part of ridding ourselves of bacteria and viruses. The issue is a long-term gut permeability where things are getting through on a regular basis, constantly stimulating the immune system, causing that inflammation, oxidative stress response, et cetera, that this entire book is the focus on. Do do do. So gluten. Oh, I can shrink. I can't shrink it anymore. It's unfortunate. Toxic parts of gluten proteins are called the gilidins and glutenins. These have higher amounts of proline and glutamine, amino acids. Together, those are called prolamines. These prolamines trigger intestinal permeability in those who are sensitive to them, which creates inflammation, and oxidative stress. Um, actually, I think that it's the inability to break down the prolamines that causes that because the prolamines themselves are inflammatory, but some people have the mechanisms to break down these prolamines and they don't react negatively to them as a result because we are largely unable to break down these components of gluten. That's where they become an issue. And not all people react to gluten terribly. Obviously some people are gluten sensitive, but 70% of the population does not react to gluten negatively. About 20 to 30% does. Um, is and you just feel better and everything works better when you don't have gluten. I fall into this category, as does my wife, but we had gluten for on and off for a lot of our lives. And I never had celiac or a response is similar to celiac. Though I did, interestingly enough, early in high school, I didn't eat gluten for an entire year. Just cut it out just for the heck of it. And then I ate a giant plate of pasta afterward, gluten pasta, like very, very gluten, I ate a whole plate of it, like a pound of pasta to myself. And afterward, like immediately after I broke out in hives all over my body, I never reacted to gluten before, but that amount of it, just massive issues. I felt like terrible. It was really, really crazy. Um, and about 1% of people have full on celiac disease. Celiac is the destruction of those epithelial cells by gluten. Sprouting and fermenting grains is a, is likely the reason why our ancestors could eat grains at a higher rate than we did and without the same issues modern people did. Even the way grains were harvested back in the day plays into their relative toxicity or not. So back in the day, they would take all the grains, they would leave them as stacks in the field. You have like those hay stacks, wheat stacks in the field before they would bring them in. And they would often just let them sit there for like days, weeks, and that would start the fermentation process. They'd actually like, they get rained on, they start 
sprouting and start fermenting in those stacks and they'd be brought in, dried out, ground up, et cetera. Uh, maybe even fermented more from there, but even the mechanism of harvesting back in the day used to favor sprouting and fermentation. And that really goes a long way to reducing the toxicity of grains and the tolerance of grains to sprouting fermentation. It goes a long way to destroying anti-nutrients and maximizing nutrients. We have other videos in the in this Meat to Warrior series about entirely dedicated to enzymes, digestion, bacteria, fermentation, all that stuff. So be sure to check those out. But just know that even a hundred years ago or less than a hundred years ago, people were not eating the same grains we are today and they were harvested in the same ways. Even the species of grains we eat, Seminilla and Duran, I believe, um, are the species of wheat we eat are very, very high in gluten, where there's other species of wheat that just aren't used that are much lower in gluten. So yeah, it can be confusing. It's like, well, why did our ancestors eat these things for so long and how come they had less issues than we did? But there's a lot, there's a lot of factors going into this. So it's not just that simple. But in general, people who react negatively to gluten, which is about 20 to 30 percent of us, do much, much better without it. Gluten links to a range of disorders, including insulin resistance, leptin resistance, Hashimoto. Neurologic disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is another autoimmune condition, irritable bowel syndrome, which is essentially a catch all term for your gut has issues and we don't know what's causing them. And then inflammatory bowel disease, which is a progression of IBS. And children eating gluten with undiagnosed celiac are underdeveloped, scrawny for their age, and express developmental delays. And this is likely because they're having nutrient malabsorption, and various issues related to that destruction of the epithelial cells in their gut. Celiac is also not really a disease. It's a mismatch between a person's genes and their environment. Same is true for all autoimmune conditions for the most part. They're a mismatch between genes and environment triggering cells to act in bizarre ways. Because I mean, if you trace it back to epigenetics, our immune system is governed by our gene expression and our gene expression is governed by our environment. So if we're having an immune system that's responding in erratic ways, that can trace back to what genes are being expressed in the immune system because everything in the body can. And what genes are expressed traces back to environmental factors of which diet is the most influential environmental factor on the immune system. So here we have the gut permeability nightmare. You see all those green ninjas. So gut permeability creates disease when an irritant creates gut permeability. Uh, the gut permeability allows fragments of food to get into the bloodstream, the innate immune system. This guy then creates a response to that, programming the adaptive immune system to clone itself and create an army of these assassins that then start attacking everything, releasing cytokines, um, which opens up allowing more intestinal permeability. And just, this just keeps going. And it just like, it just keeps going until I mean, either the food source is eliminated through diarrhea or ultimately, or just normal elimination or, or it just keeps going. I mean, ultimately people who continue consuming these things that irritate them, their body simply does this constantly and it creates a massive, massive series of issues. Um, destruction of these epithelial cells in children leads to nutrient malabsorption, failure to thrive. It's a serious thing. I mean, in adults, it does too. Uh, from my own personal experience, one of the best things I've done for my health is focus on my gut. And funny enough, I actually need less vitamin supplements and less food in general to feel good and energized. My gut is healthier. So I'm absorbing more of these nutrients and it's just, it's more efficient ultimately. So more on gluten. The best way to determine if you have a gluten tolerance or celiac is to completely eliminate gluten for at least two months. Monitor your symptoms, see how you feel and reintroduce it. See what happens. Um, irritable bowel syndrome can be caused by gluten intolerance if you're consuming that. And it is a catch-all term, as I said, for gut issues that don't have an identifiable cause. Some of the issues that people have giving up gluten, people estimate or trace back the fact that gluten has an opiate response in the brain. When you consume gluten, your brain produces opiates, 
you know, or opiate like compounds. And it makes sense. I mean, no one ever says like, I can never give up broccoli, but people are like, I can never give up pizza. I can never give up pasta. I can never give up bread. And it's likely because it has a, having a drug like effect on their brain. Just something to consider. Um, it's addictive and it causes sickness, like many addictive things. So if you're having trouble giving up gluten, it's not because it makes you happy per se, it's because it's uh, addictive. Also, I think this may be accurate, but I just wanted to share this. I think that in people with celiac disease, there's actual, and gluten intolerance, there's actually an enhanced opioid effect from gluten, which could have to do with um, the body trying to numb the pain of the immune response that it's having to it, but Continuing on, be careful of grains in general, because grains, even non-gluten containing grains, can have other compounds in them that are similar to gluten or that cause gut irritation. Grains are very high in anti-nutrients, phylates, these compounds that can cause irritation in many, many people. So you want to be very cautious about grains. Eliminate grains for a period of time, add them back in, add in certain grains, play around with it. Be very, very cautious about grains, see how you feel with them see which grains cause issues, see if there's certain ways of preparing grains that make them not cause issues. And also grains in general have a generous helping of glyphosate, which is a pesticide sprayed on grains. So not the best thing either. So stress and intestinal permeability. So the gut based nervous system is called the enteric nervous system. And this is also called the second brain. People call the gut the second brain. And that makes sense as the gut produces the majority of neurotransmitters, the majority of our serotonin. And we keep finding out that it does more and more for our neurotransmitter function. So really the gut is like the origin of all the things the brain uses for proper functioning. And in the absence of proper gut function, we're not gonna have proper brain function or proper function of anything in our body. And similarly, uh, the entroglial cells are similar to the astrocytes in the brain that comprise the blood brain barrier and prevent, and these for help prevent intestinal permeability. So there actually is a lot of similarity in the structure of the gut and the brain and how they're isolated from the rest of the body and kept isolated from various environmental influences to try to prevent issues from coming up in these two very, very important regulatory parts of the body. Communication along the gut-brain axis explains how psychological stress states can produce diarrhea. Gut-brain axis is regulated by the vagus nerve, which controls gastrointestinal function, appetite control, body weight control, all these different things. So ultimately, gut and brain are very, 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 very connected. Our, they're in constant communication. Uh, the state of our mental health affects the state of our gut. The state of our gut health affects the state of our mental health. And they're more closely connected than most systems in the body. But all of our systems in the body are incredibly connected. And you can't separate one from the other. I mean, unless you, the only way to separate a system from one other system in the body is to cut it out, which usually causes death. So we're going to be dealing with systems as a whole and how they all work together. And this is one way of exploring that is this gut brain axis. And the vagus nerve is also the primary carrier of the parasympathetic, the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we have disrupted gut function, that is then going to disrupt the vagus nerve as that is regulated by the gut brain axis. And that is also going to prevent us from having those relaxative anti-inflammatory states that our body needs to recover, the rest and digest, feed and breathe system, and we'll be stuck in fight or flight mode. And here we have a direct excerpt from the book on how gut inflammation leads to chronic stress, or gut inflammation from chronic stress leads to chronic disease. So psychological or physical stress leads to high sympathetic nervous system activity. This responds by decreasing the parasympathetic nervous system that then causes uh, increased intestinal permeability. Increased intestinal permeability activates the gut immune system and then that leads to inflammation. Inflammation 
leads to more intestinal permeability, also symptoms as diarrhea and bloating, and then chronic stress leads to chronic intestinal permeability, which leads to chronic inflammation. And then the chronic inflammation leads to diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, heart disease, and pretty much every other disease because disease is simply a breakdown of a system in the body and the body breaks down its weakest link. So once the gut, which is the one of the first lines of defense and the first lines of rejuvenation for the body becomes compromised, you're just going to start breaking down your weakest link, whether that's blood pressure, pancreas, autoimmunity, cancer, heart disease, obesity, whatever it is, you're just going to break down there. So chronic inflammation leads to these, but it also leads to everything. And locally in the gut, stress activates the ENS to produce corticotropin-releasing hormone. Corticotropin-releasing hormone activates cells that release cytokines. Cytokines disrupt tight junctions, leading intestinal permeability, intestinal permeability, chronic inflammation, chronic stress and chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation leads to diabetes and stuff. And chronic inflammation also leads to chronic stress. These are all related, so keep that in mind. Dysbiosis and intestinal permeability. So one of the other, the third cause of intestinal permeability is dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is the dysregulation of the balance of gut bacteria in our bodies and the different species. So we have roughly 150 to 200 species inside us at any given time. Some of these will be potentially pathogenic species that create an immune response. The other species will be what we call beneficial species, but really those are species that create anti-inflammatory or, or uh, parasympathetic and calm the immune system down response. And having a balance of these is necessary for health. There's roughly a thousand different species that can live in our gut at any point in time. We want a high diversity because by having a high diversity, we have a high number of genetic diversity within these bacteria, which then has a beneficial epigenetic effect on us. Dysbiosis happens when the pathogenic bacteria that create inflammation outnumber and outreproduce the bacteria that calm inflammation down, and that leads to chronic intestinal permeability. And here we see there's a strong correlation between the diversity of gut bacteria and the health of a person in general, with obese people having a smaller diversity of gut bacteria than healthy people. And early life conditions in the womb and shortly after have a strong effect on gut microbiome in people. And here are the other things that have an impact on it, geography, age, how you were born, how you were fed as an infant, um, stress, exercise, psychological state, metabolic states, the state of your body in general and stress. Though exercise actually independently does have a positive effect on gut bacteria. Diet also, pharmaceuticals or drug use, these are all factors that influence our gut bacteria. And here is a direct quote from the book talking about how the bacteria in our body contain tenfold more cells than in the human body, 10 times more bacteria than you, essentially, and 100 times the number of genes in the human genome, and it has the metabolic capacity of an entire organ. So really, your gut bacteria is essentially an essential organ in your body, without which you couldn't function. Another fun fact is that I think about 30% of your daily protein needs are met from your gut bacteria. Your gut bacteria actually produce proteins that your body uses. So, and they, and they produce vitamins, minerals, make them more available. Like they're really like, they're like the other side of food. There's like what you put in and there's what your body does with it once you put it in and pretty much most of what your body does with food once you put it in is determined by gut bacteria. They're that important. And here we have talking more about factors that influence gut microbiome, location of birth, formula versus breastfeeding, lifetime antibiotic use. Um, I mostly leave all this stuff in the slides because I'm going to post the slides to the videos. So you can go through the slides if you simply want a refresher. Whereas if you want more in-depth explanation you can watch the entire video where i share a lot of information that is just not in the slides asthma and type 1 diabetes are also strongly correlated with factors that influence a poor gut microbiome and our gut microbiome programs or metabolism and as i said earlier there's a necessary balance between the types of gut bacteria needed for health gut bacteria ferments 
fiber into the short chain fatty acid butyrate, also propanate and acetate. These short chain fatty acids feed our intestinal lining. They feed the brain to a degree, have powerful anti-inflammatory effects, anti-cancer effects. Very, very, very necessary. Absent these short chain fatty acids will experience epithelial cell die off, which will hurt our nutrient absorption and everything else. Good gut bacteria detoxify harmful compounds in our food and water. They keep the balance between good and bad bacteria. They are crucial for the development of our immune system, prevent insulin resistance and diabetes, and protect against autoimmune diseases. Very, 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 very powerful stuff. And here we have fermented foods, which everyone should be making and eating because these things are amazing for your gut. Here I have a nice little diagram talking more about factors that your gut influences immunity, vitamin absorption, metabolism, autism, even inflammation. Yeah, it's very, very intense. Bad gut microbes lead to increased inflammation, leads to poor quality of life. Pay attention to your gut. Beneficial gut bacteria stimulates the formation of Treg cells that calm the immune system down and prevent autoimmunity. Good gut bacteria prevents the immune system in this way from becoming overactive and causing chronic diseases. And those with IBS generally have lower uh, quantity and type of bacteria than those without IBS. So it really is just like, like having a really robust gut microbiome is predictive of all sorts of health and having a poor gut microbiome is predictive of every sort of ill health, especially types of ill health that start in the gut. And pathogenic bacteria trigger the formation of adaptive assassin cells. This is probably why we need them, because if we don't have any of those adaptive assassins, then we actually can't have an immune response. We see down here, too many Treg cells, not enough adaptive assassins creates an immune system that can't respond to infection. And a quote from the book, as in real life, we need both warriors and anti-war protesters, else we go too far in either direction. That is true. We need warriors and anti-war protesters. We need both sides. They seem opposed, but as with all opposites, they need each other. So here we have gut bacteria in the immune system. Artificial sweeteners. This is not in the book. This is just my own experience. Artificial sweeteners feed the growth of pathogenic bacteria and can be principal cause of IBS, SIBO, and other unpleasant gut dysfunctions. I have seen the combination of artificial sweeteners and caffeine and energy drinks. Those two things together are essentially a recipe for dysbiosis. The caffeine and the artificial sweeteners, the caffeine places stress on the gut and the artificial sweeteners feed, directly feed bad gut bacteria. Just stay away from those things. Like take caffeine pills, drink coffee. If you must have caffeine, do not consume it in the form of energy drinks because it will cause SIBO. It will cause gut issues. It just, it will. I've coached people who the entire cause of their gut issues is just simply been the consumption of energy drinks. These things are the plague. Like even myself, I completely destroyed my gut at one point through the consumption of energy drinks. It is awful. If you have destroyed your gut through the consumption of energy drinks though, you can replenish your gut by stopping their consumption and also consuming large amounts of fermentable fiber with digestive enzymes and probiotics in many different forms and all the time. Like I would literally like, this is how I fixed it. I literally pounded, I would eat like an entire salad in the morning, like a huge salad in the morning, pound like five or eight enzyme capsules. Cause I had no enzyme production in my gut. And then I'd take like half a bottle of probiotics or just some absurd quantity of very, very potent probiotics as long as consuming raw milk and other things that have natural probiotics in them or more naturally sourced probiotics. And I did this for about a month or two. And I had some very, very immediate benefits of doing so. Like my food started getting digested right away. I did this three times a day, actually. I'd have like a salad, then I'd have like a bunch of gluten-free pasta, and then I'd have like a bunch of fruit. And I would just like just salad, pasta, fruit, salad, pasta, fruit, potatoes, just starchy, fibrous fermentable things i was eating other foods at the time too but very 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 important to not destroy your gut but if you do you can fix it it's just 
takes a little bit of time and a lot of enzymes, like probably like hundreds of dollars of enzymes and like hundreds of dollars of probiotics and just like then weeks and months and even like a year before my gut returned consistently to optimal functioning. So don't mess with your gut because it'll get stuck in a rut. Um, acne is also an inflammatory condition associated with pathogenic bacteria overgrowth. So really like all dysfunction can be traced back to inflammation, which can be traced back in the most part to dysfunctional gut because our gut is the primary regulator of the immune system, which is the primary regulator of inflammation. So if you are having acne, um, or skin conditions, it would be very useful to look into, things that can be causing inflammation, either gut issues, excessive hormetic stress, et cetera. What causes dysbiosis? So here we have a happy gut and here we have Socrates saying that all disease begins in the gut. Fascinating. So diet is the primary driver of dysbiosis, but stress, inflammation, other factors will also play a role. But as the most the quickest way to influence the gut is just to put stuff in it, which is diet. So diet is the main factor. Antibiotic use primes the body for dysbiosis by killing off all the bacteria, which can leave it open to being taken over by C. diff and other bad bacteria that causes inflammation. And for the most part, flour, sugar, seed oils, refined sugars, things that didn't exist 100 years ago, feed bad bacteria disproportionately and seem to be the primary cause of dysbiosis also imbalanced ph drug use alcohol consumption poor water quality and these other things can influence dysbiosis by creating a bad environment in the gut but it's it's it'll take a combination of things for the most part but if you're experiencing issues any any of these all of these should be eliminated or looked into Especially drug use. Drug use, like even smoking, like even drugs that don't go into your gut do cause changes in the gut function, which can lead to dysbiosis, SIBO, and these sorts of things. Also, imbalanced macronutrient and micronutrient deficiency, either through creating stress on the body and mind, because you need like you need nutrients to produce neurotransmitters. And if you can't produce neurotransmitters, then that's going to make your brain stressed out, which is going to fuck with your gut. Examples of that can be as simple as salt. If you have too little salt, your brain cannot eliminate cortisol, which again leads to stress. There's a, we're going to be exploring a lot of that later in this course, but the, the connection between minerals and vitamins and neurotransmitters, but definitely macronutrients, over, like overeating on protein, overeating on these things either by causing stress or simply by overfeeding certain types of bacteria cutting down on overall diversity um can cause dysbiosis so really i mean really anything that can make you unhealthy can cause dysbiosis but and then dysbiosis leads to inflammation which leads to everything else that makes you unhealthy like these things are all connected there's really we can draw straight lines of causation, but really it's, I mean, there is no straight line. I mean, look in the body and show me a straight line. I guess the straightest line in the body is the digestive system, which is from mouth to anus. That's the straightest line in the body. So if you want to look for the straightest line of causality, it would be that. Um, other straight lines include the straight line of oxygen input in the body. It's pretty straightforward. Our body takes in oxygen to our bloodstream via the lungs anything that interferes with that is bad but again all these things factor into each other so here we're looking at one direction the arrow of causality fault goes into but as we've already talked about gut dysbiosis can lead to micronutrient deficiency so yeah and then what macronutrients your body needs are influenced by the health of your gut so it's not, it's not super, it's just not straightforward is what I'm trying to get at. But these are all factors that can cause dysbiosis and dysbiosis can in fact cause all these factors. Except, I mean, it's funny enough, it actually can cause the consumption of sugar, flour, seed oils and stuff because eating those things or just having dysbiosis in general will make us 
crave foods that are bad for us. So yeah, even dysbiosis can cause consumption of refined sugar, flour, and seed oils. It's, it is a circular system. Here we have a very fascinating story about the boy who had the gluten issue. Um, we're going to explore that in right now. So what the hell? Technology, man. Uh, so type 1 diabetes study revisited. So in the initial case, the six-year-old with type 1 diabetes, gluten was likely the trigger of intestinal permeability. Intestinal permeability led to a chronic adaptive immune system response by exposing his immune system to form molecules. His individual genetics less than predisposed to an agitated immune system. And that started targeting his own cells in case the, in this case, the cells of his pancreas and started to destroy them. And it is plausible that he had dysbiosis, uh, leaving him a fewer trig cells and hippies to tame this out to like calm down his immune response. But again, we're not entirely crystal clear on all the scientific causes of autoimmunity, but we do know that we need proper gut bacteria to produce Treg cells to calm down the assassin cells produced by the encounter of foreign matter with the innate immune system, leading to, again, these adaptive assassins that attack the foreign matter, but they can become over agitated and start attacking our own immune system. It's also another factor where certain bad bacteria in our gut can have similar structures to cells in our body. And when we have intestinal permeability, these cells, these bacterial cells with similar looks to our own cells get through our body builds an immune response to these cells. But because they look so similar in certain ways to our own body's cells, we then start attacking them. And that could be the reason why in this case, the insulin is the insulin producing cells, of the pancreas were attacked. Whereas in other cases, it's the thyroid, the myelin or um, the joints, because I'm, I'm speculating, but I think they make sense that those systems, those organ systems and cells in those organ systems had cells that had structures in them that were analogous to structures in pathogenic bacteria species that got through the gut barrier during a period of intestinal permeability, triggering the adaptive immune system to target them. And then indirectly triggering the adaptive immune system to target the cells of our own body. But really, really the culprit is intestinal permeability, which is highly implicated in all causes of autoimmunity. So luckily his condition was caught early and treated early, and he's able to save insulin producing cells of his pancreas and no longer needs insulin injections. So ultimately um, that was a good thing. We were able to prevent him having this lifelong condition by simply removing gluten from his diet. And yeah, I mean, my kids are on a gluten-free diet. Don't recommend giving gluten to your kids. And I recommend experimenting with a lot of time without gluten. To see if you react to it because yeah, I mean, like literally like this guy would have had diabetes for his entire life eating something that everyone eats on a daily basis and people think is totally okay, which is crazy to me. Like, I mean, it makes sense. I had insomnia for 19 years and the consumption of soy. So that's at everything. So yeah, it's very, very common that these dietary triggers that we shouldn't be consuming cause massive, massive, massive negative effects. And that is it. Stay tuned for the next video.